Hello everyone, today we're looking at a video called Which God Exists? Creation and Evolution. I don't think he's saying the two possibilities for which God exists are creation or evolution. I think that creation and evolution part is just tacked onto the title for some reason. This video really doesn't have anything to do with creationism, at least not directly. Well, let's look at it. If you're watching this video about which God exists, it's probably for one of two reasons. I could be wrong, but I bet my reason won't be one of the two. First, you may be convinced by the arguments for the existence of God. You're joking, right? Such as the argument from design or the cosmological argument based on cause and effect. Yeah, see, that's what I mean. You're joking, right? And you're sincerely trying to determine which God exists. Second, it could be that you're not convinced that God exists. You recognize, however, that even if the arguments are logical and correct, that still doesn't prove which God exists. So yeah, I was right. My reason for watching this video doesn't show up here. Now, you might think my reason for watching this video is to debunk it, but no, that's not the case. My original reason for watching this video was that it came up in a search on YouTube when I was looking for videos and I thought maybe it would be funny. It has creation and evolution in the title. By the way, can I go off on a tangent here for a second and talk about YouTube search? Look at what I have to deal with here, okay? I type in God exists into the search bar and then I go to filters, upload date to get the newest ones. And look at what I have, shorts, a whole block of shorts, 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 more shorts, an entire whole block again, shorts, 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 shorts. Can you guys stop watching these so that YouTube stops pushing them so hard? If you just ignore this stuff, it'll eventually go away. Please, I'm begging you. I'm so swamped with these goddamn shorts, shorts, shorts everywhere. Look at this. More shorts, more shorts, another block of shorts, shorts. How am I supposed to find videos to respond to? Everything is just completely drowned in shorts. Shorts aren't proper videos the same way a single potato chip isn't a proper meal. Lay off, YouTube. Please. You're not TikTok. What makes YouTube so good is that videos are long and involved and produced and worthwhile. That's why people liked it so much when you finally let people start making videos longer than 10 minutes. Okay, rant over. Back to my original rant. You would rightly require further evidence from theists as to how they know their God exists. Which is it? Allah, Krishna, the God of the Bible, or the flying spaghetti monster? Okay, I'm glad that you acknowledge that the Kalam cosmological argument doesn't establish the Christian God. It's good. It's nothing special, though. It's pretty common for people to acknowledge that. But still, you know, I'm happy about it. Or maybe you're sitting somewhere in the middle of these propositions. In the middle of what propositions? In the middle of the propositions that you're convinced by the arguments for God's existence or not convinced by the arguments for God's existence? I think that's the only thing you mentioned where people can have two different positions. Because you said that in both of those cases you'll be asking, yeah, but which God? So the positions that we're talking about being in the middle of are convinced or not convinced. That there's a God in general. But how can you be in the middle of convinced or not convinced? A or not A? There's no middle there to be in. It's a pure dichotomy. You're either one or the other. Although, thinking about it, that could be me ascribing too much rationality to humans. Cognitive dissonance is a real and powerful thing, and maybe that could actually allow someone to feel convinced and not convinced at the same time, somehow. Sometimes people behave in ways that I just don't find myself able to understand. Wherever you are in this discussion, I'd like to make a reasonable case that the God of the Bible is the God that exists. Okay, so I understand how that would be relevant to the people who accept the arguments for a general God and then want to clarify which God that is. For the people who don't accept the arguments for God and are not convinced that there is one, which by the way you actually seem to acknowledge is a possibility, thank you. I'm so used to dealing with Almondo I forget that some people actually acknowledge that non-belief is possible. But yeah, for those people, I assume that what we're going for here is convincing them that in the hypothetical scenario that they do come to believe in the existence of a God, they would be reasonable to proceed immediately to your God. Which, while it seems not immediately relevant and maybe a little premature, is not unreasonable, I think. So far, I gotta say, this video feels like a breath of fresh air. I've really got myself used to dealing with extreme unreasonableness over the past several months, and I'm starting to hope that this might actually be a bit of a relief from that. Of course I'm gonna disagree with a lot of what's said, but at least maybe I won't disagree fundamentally with the entire approach. Now, please understand, I'm not assuming you believe in the Bible, or are even convinced that any god exist. I noticed, and I appreciate that, more than you can know. I'm simply saying that if evidence I'm presenting is valid, then the conclusion that the God of the Bible is real is also 
valid. Ooh, nope, nope, not liking that. Look, there are lots of positions out there for which there is valid evidence, some of which are right and some of which are wrong. Leaping to a particular conclusion based solely on the fact that there is some valid evidence in support of it is not valid. Deciding which conclusions are likely true is a bit more complicated than that. But that's a minor thing, or at least it seems that way at this point, so I'll hear you out. First, if the cosmological argument from the law of cause and effect shows that there must be an eternal extremely powerful, non-material or supernatural being, then the God of the Bible fits that description. Yes, I'm aware that the God of the Bible is a God. We're not talking about whether the God of the Bible fits the description of a general God. We agree on that. What this video is supposed to be about is whether it's reasonable to believe in the existence of the God of the Bible to the exclusion of other gods. For the sake of the discussion, we've already assumed that there is some God in general. You're either talking to people who've already accepted those arguments, or to people who haven't yet accepted those arguments, but you're talking to them about what they should reasonably believe after they do accept those arguments eventually. We're talking about next steps after the cosmological argument. Once somebody's already accepted accepted that a general God exists, a God that created the universe. And I think people are quite aware already that the Christian God is a God of that type that people believe in. Psalm 90 verse 2 states, Before the mountains were brought forth, or even you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Uh-huh. So Psalm 90 says God always existed. Look, I'm not really sure why we're focusing so much on your God here. We understand that your God is consistent with the God of the cosmological argument. That's why you guys use the cosmological argument to support your God. If somebody's accepted the existence of a God from the cosmological argument, it's probably because they heard it from you. I think most people would probably assume that if you're making an argument in support of a God, you probably think it's consistent with your God, because otherwise why would you do it? If anything, you should be talking about why other gods are not consistent with this, because then you're eliminating them, narrowing the field, and making it seem more likely that your god is the one. That's also a reason to not start talking about why your god is consistent with a very broad general kind of argument like the cosmological argument, because the result of that is you eliminating almost no gods that anyone believes in today. You should pick something more specific, something narrower, and say, only my god meets these criteria, or only a few gods at least. Am I being clear enough on what my problem is here? I'm not sure if I am. It seems clear to me, but it's not always easy to know if that's true. I'm just going to move on. Also, Genesis 17.1 describes God as Almighty God. Wow, what a revelation. Yes, we're aware that you have an eternally existing, super powerful God. Again, this really does not do a lot for us in terms of narrowing the field of possibilities. So, if the cosmological argument is valid, and this physical universe needs a supernatural, all-powerful God, then the God of the Bible fits that description. Right, sure it does. But that's not what you said before. Before you said, if evidence I'm presenting is valid, in this case the cosmological argument, then the conclusion that the God of the Bible is real is also valid. And no, I'm sorry, but the mere consistency of the characteristics of your preferred God with the God of the cosmological argument does not make the conclusion that the God of the Bible is in fact real valid. This does nothing to get you to, therefore believing in my God in particular is valid. Now, if you had picked some argument where the conclusions about the nature of a God matched your God's characteristics, but did not match the characteristics of lots of other gods, thus significantly narrowing the field, that would get you closer to a justification that the conclusion that the God of the Bible is real is valid. It wouldn't get you all the way, but it would get you some of the way. But the cosmological argument is just too broad, it doesn't really get you anywhere. We're still stuck at square one here just agreeing that some general God exists. So, in my opinion, this whole part of the video could have been cut. But maybe your next argument will do better. Other ideas of a God would as well, including Allah of the Quran, so we must continue our discussion. Well, yeah, exactly. You could come up with literally infinite gods that fit that description. As long as you say it's eternal, powerful, and supernatural, anything else you can imagine fits. As you mentioned earlier, the flying spaghetti monster fits. Which again is why I say this entire part could have been cut, especially because it's just redundant, since for the purposes of the discussion we've already agreed on this. The whole point of this video is that we're moving forward from this, so why are we still focusing on this? Second, 
If the argument from design is valid, then you have the exact same problem. This is the second of the two arguments that you mentioned at the start. The two arguments that you said only get you to some kind of general god, and then leave you asking, yeah, but which one? Again, I understand that your god is consistent with this. That's why Christians love this argument so much. But why are we stuck here talking about it in this context? And design in the material universe demands an intelligent designer. Again, the God of the Bible fits this description, since he's described as possessing unlimited intelligence. Yes, I get it. Can we go on to the next one, please? Isaiah 48, 28 says, Oh, come on! Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable. You slowed that down really dramatically there at the end, like you're telling me something profound and new. Do you even really need to bring up Bible quotes for this? You could just say, yeah, the God that we believe in is all-knowing and infinitely intelligent. And everyone would probably go, okay, sure. You're the one who believes the thing. You're the one who's trying to convince me of the thing. If you say, here's what I believe the thing is like, what am I going to say? No, it isn't. Source, please. I don't believe that you believe that the thing is the way that you say you believe the thing is. Prove it. Yeah, nobody reasonable is going to do that. That would be as ridiculous as when Christians insist that atheists actually believe there's a God and just lie about it. Again, other ideas of the Creator would match this description as well. So we continue. Okay, well, at the very least, we're past the two arguments you brought up at the start. The two arguments that only get you as far as general God. So at least now we should be on to different arguments that are hopefully a little more specific. Third, if the moral argument is valid and objective right and wrong exist, then the Creator must have a moral nature from which humans could derive and understand morality. Well, that's more of a theological assumption than an inevitable conclusion. I mean, you're saying if there's objective morality, therefore that morality must come from the nature of a god. Which, even if you assume that objective morality would have to be established by a god, that doesn't mean it comes from its intrinsic nature. Any more than any other thing established by the god would have to come from its intrinsic nature. It's like saying if there are objective laws of physics, therefore those laws of physics must derive from god's physical nature. Despite him supposedly being non-physical. Or if there are objectively ice cream stands, then therefore those must derive from God's nature as an ice cream stand. This whole thing of objective morality having to originate from God's intrinsically moral nature is just bald theology. It's just a thing you say. It's not some conclusion we're led to through argument. It's just a claim. And it's one that, at least in this video, you don't support. But you really should, because you're trying to convince me that your God is the one that I have to believe in if morality exists. But you don't actually provide anything that would make me think that that's the case. And in my experience, that's not unusual. Nobody ever really does. They just kind of insist upon it, and then they pretend that's an argument somehow. Now, the Bible clearly states that God's nature is one which values moral conduct. Oh, so we're doing the, my God is consistent with this thing again? Okay, I mean, showing that he's consistent with this, I guess, is fine. But again, so are literally infinite other gods. The flying spaghetti monster made objective morality. I wouldn't normally use the flying spaghetti monster example, but you brought it up this time. And it causes a problem because it shows that these points that you're bringing up don't narrow things down to your God, or even really anywhere closer to it. Psalm 11, 7 states, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Okay, well again, as you mentioned with the cosmological argument, Allah fits that too. And we're clearly distinguishing him as a separate god, as you just did. So, yeah, we're gonna need to go further with this. So far, I wouldn't really say that we've accomplished much. But next, we finally get to a more specific argument. Fourth, if the Bible exhibits traits of divine inspiration that couldn't have been the product of mere humans, then the God described in the pages of the Bible would be the creator. Which, if you think about it for a second, is a truly bizarre point. First, I mean, for the atheists in the crowd, I suspect a lot of you agree that characterizing the Bible as something that clearly is divinely inspired and could not possibly be written by humans is absurd to the point of comedy. But setting that aside, if the Bible contained something that could not have been the product of human writers, that would not tell us that a god as described in the Bible is the being that actually inspired the Bible. Consider, for example, that the Norse gods are the gods that truly exist, and the Bible is a trick by 
by Loki to fool the world into a false understanding of reality. So he goes and whispers in the ears of some Middle Eastern folk and there you go. Or maybe the Muslims are right. Maybe everyone really is born Muslim, hence why they call converts reverts, meaning that they were originally Muslim. And the Bible is simply a trick from Shaitan, meant to misguide people about the true nature of their religion and convince them to raise their children as Jews or Christians instead of in the one true faith of Islam. Or maybe the Bible really was written by the creator god of the universe, but part of that creator god's perfect, unknowable, mysterious plan for the universe requires that human beings don't have a guide to the true nature of reality, to the nature of God and the world he created. Perhaps because revealing himself in that way through a book would be a violation of free will, the same way that revealing himself directly to a person would be a violation of free will, which is the excuse I always hear for why God doesn't just reveal himself unambiguously and perfectly clearly to everyone on the planet so that everyone has an obvious reason to believe. Christians consider the Bible to be a very obvious reason to believe as well, and maybe God does too. Maybe God thinks, yeah, that's too obvious. It's gonna violate free will somehow. It'll also diminish the need for faith just by being way too clear. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna make a book to fool people, just like I made Satan to fool people, just like I made dinosaur fossils to fool people, and the ones who see through it, the ones who avoid all of these traps, are the ones truly worthy of me, the ones who can pass the test and go to heaven. I can go all day like this, man. If there were a book that I thought a person couldn't write without help from some supernatural entity, which, in my opinion, really does not describe the Bible, but if I thought it did, that wouldn't actually tell me what entity is behind the Bible because there are so many possibilities there. If I bought into this claim that the Bible cannot be written by humans or by any natural being, and it had to be supernaturally assisted, which you don't appear to support in this video, then that would convince me there's some kind of supernatural entity behind it, but why would I leap to the conclusion that therefore that entity must be God? And this is assuming that I accept the cosmological argument and think there is a God. If I accept there is a God, and I accept there's a book that purports to be inspired by a God, and which I find clearly inspired by some kind of supernatural entity, that doesn't mean that I accept that said supernatural entity must be that God. There's no connective tissue there. The world proposed by Christians is full of supernatural entities. Demons, the devil, and even this supposed perfect truthfulness of the God itself is something they just assert and don't argue for. It's another one of those theological assumptions. So how could I leap to your conclusion about what the supposedly supernatural nature of the Bible implies? I don't have any basis for that. The Bible writers certainly claimed inspiration. 1 Timothy 3.16 boldly states that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. A study of that verse and others like it shows that the scripture being discussed is the compiled 66 books of the Old and New Testaments that are in the Bible. Paul's talking about random letters he's writing to people as if they themselves are books of scripture. That doesn't sound very likely on the face of it, especially considering that one verse before that, he says that Timothy has known the holy scriptures from infancy. So if Paul's letter to Timothy right now is part of the holy scriptures, well, at the very least, the scriptures Timothy knew were incomplete. You're saying this letter refers to the 66 books of the Bible, but at this point, all 66 books wouldn't even have existed. Also, does this letter actually read like it's intended to be anything other than personal communication? Does it really read like Paul is intending for this to be included as a book of scripture? 2 Timothy 4 verses 9 through 13. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he's helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. This feels as scriptural as a shopping list. Or how about this, also from 2 Timothy 4, the last few verses. Greet Priscilla and Aquila at the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. If when Paul refers to scripture, he's referring to all 66 books of the Bible, including this, then why is it written like some card I would get at Christmas? I don't think the intention is for this to be taken as actually part of the scripture. 
scriptures. And the same applies to the other letters, of which much of the New Testament consists. That seems like something other people would have decided long after the fact. And frankly, it was a bad decision, in my opinion, because the inclusion of these undermines the divinely inspired appearance of the New Testament pretty badly. It feels like people just put a bunch of random shit in a binder. More to the point, though, you're using this verse as evidence that the Bible writers claimed inspiration. The Bible writers certainly claimed inspiration. 1 Timothy 3.16 boldly states that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. But that verse is not the Bible writers claiming inspiration. That verse is Paul claiming that the other Bible writers were inspired. That's a real big distinction. I'm not sure that verse is doing what you want it to. We've presented evidence for the divine inspiration of the Bible, such as its perfectly accurate history. You're joking, right? Predictive prophecy, scientific foreknowledge, and unity. <sighs> You're joking, right? Sorry, but that's about all I got here, because there's no specifics. But I'm sure I've probably covered some of the specifics on my channel in the past. In other videos and articles. And let me reiterate that I'm not assuming you believe the Bible to be inspired. Okay, that's good. I'm simply saying that if the Bible exhibits traits of inspiration, then the God described in its pages would be the creator. I strongly disagree. I think that argument is severely flawed for the aforementioned reasons. But if all this is meant to be purely hypothetical and I'm not supposed to be convinced by this point, why did you bring up that Second Timothy stuff and the idea that the Bible writers said they were inspired by God? And like, what was the relevance of that to the argument? I don't know. I'm finding the structure of this video a bit confusing. That's all. Fifth. If the personality, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are historical and true, then the God that Jesus presents to the world is the Creator. Oh, I really disagree with that. It's the same thing as the divine inspiration one. I can come up with so many other possibilities that are equally or more plausible that I have no reason to assume that the possibility you want me to accept is true to the exclusion of all others. I don't grant any of this, of course, that the Bible is some perfect record of the life of Jesus, that he rose from the dead, and all the other stuff. But if I do grant it for the sake of argument, it doesn't take much imagination to show me that the explanation you propose is far from the only one. You've done this discounting of alternative possibilities with regard to the inspiration of the Bible and the life and death of Jesus now. In both of these cases, you've assumed that your preferred explanation is the only possible one and must therefore be true. And it's funny to see that in this video in particular, which is all about not assuming one specific explanation based on a set of facts which admits of many other explanations. The whole premise of this video is that if you accept the cosmological argument and you accept that the existence of the universe requires explanation by some god, that still allows for the universe to be explained by many gods, not just yours. There are many possible explanations beyond the one that you like. You seem to understand that point perfectly fine at the start of the video, when you said that people rightly require further evidence to narrow the possibilities down to your god specifically, your preferred explanation. But twice now, you've ignored or simply failed to recognize that the same very justified requirement applies to these supposed facts, the properties of the Bible and Jesus, too. You have to actually argue to your explanations for these things being the true ones. You don't just get them for free any more than you get the Christian God for free after making the cosmological argument. Since Jesus performed miracles, fulfilled prophecy, was born of a virgin, miraculously ascended back to heaven, lived a perfectly sinless life, and accomplished a host of other supernatural feats, then his life would be evidence of the validity of the supernatural God he championed. Evidence of it? As in something that makes it seem at least somewhat more likely? Yeah, I would say it would be evidence of it. Again, of course, assuming that you could actually establish these things, which you haven't. If you established all of that, I would see your explanation as less absurd, more likely. Somewhat. But that doesn't mean I would then say, therefore it has to be true. Therefore it's the only possible explanation. That would be foolish. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, whether we're talking about your religion or something entirely unrelated. A scientific claim, a courtroom trial. If there's some evidence in support of some explanation, that doesn't imply that therefore that explanation just is true, as you've just implied. To settle on a particular explanation based on the evidence, you should have sufficient evidence to establish that 
this explanation is true to the likely exclusion of other competing explanations. And you should be aware that some other explanation could come along that fits that evidence as well as future evidence better. The history of science contains a lot of ideas that were supported by at least some evidence, and yet were not correct. Wrongful convictions, too, can be made based on evidence, and even good evidence, and yet the person is innocent. And when you get into this realm that we're talking about, the realm of the supernatural, where basically every explanation is as outlandish and unbelievable as any other one, it's really hard to establish that any particular one is very likely to be true. Sorry, but that's just the nature of the thing, and if you actually care what's true, then jumping to one random supernatural explanation just because you feel like it isn't sufficient. Fortunately, this is a problem that we don't really have to worry about much, because as far as I can tell, there's no real reason to actually accept any of the things that you're saying. That Jesus actually existed specifically as described in the Bible, that he rose from the dead, that sin is even a meaningful, quantifiable concept, where you can talk about how much or how little someone did of it, that the Bible is in fact divinely inspired as opposed to Paul just saying it is, or that the cosmological or design arguments are in any way compelling. We're going all the way down this road of me granting thing after thing after thing for the sake of argument. That God created the universe, that the Bible is supernaturally inspired, that Jesus rose from the dead, and still your religion falls flat for me. This is the problem. It's not just based on shoddy reasoning at the top level, of like whether God exists. It's based on shoddy reasoning the whole way down. On every level, it's based on this assumption that your explanations for everything are right just because. Which God did Jesus champion? It's clear that he presented himself as speaking about the God of the Bible. Gee, really, you think? We can see then that if the cosmological argument, design argument, moral argument, the inspiration of the Bible, and the factuality of Jesus' life are valid, then the God of the Bible corresponds with what we know about the supernatural creator. That is one hell of a pile of ifs, and I reject every single one of those. I really don't know what you were hoping to accomplish here. This seems to be directed at people who've only just accepted the cosmological argument, and then you throw all these ifs at them. What's that supposed to do? And then of course even all of those ifs, if every single one of those things is true, that still doesn't actually show what you want it to show. Not with very good confidence anyway. So what is this video supposed to accomplish? A person might suggest, however, that even though these arguments would point to the God of the Bible. He's just one God among many. And there are others who would fit the description as well. Uh, sure, not only could other gods accomplish everything that you've pointed out here if it were in fact true, but many other types of entities as well. Demons, aliens, hyper-technologically advanced humans from the future, or in the case of things like Jesus rising from the dead, just a misdiagnosis of death. That used to happen all the time, that's why they had those little bells on graves at a certain point, just in case they buried someone alive. Most of the stuff Christians talk about as being totally unexplainable through anything but a god is very much explainable through many things other than a god. Just because you say it's not, doesn't make it so. That simply can't be true if the God of the Bible fits the description. Since he insists he's the only one. You're joking, right? In Isaiah 45, 5, God is on record as saying, I am the Lord, and there is no other, there is no other God besides me. So even if other gods are consistent with all the things you just pointed out, it has to be your God because the Bible says there's just one God. You have to be joking, right? Ephesians 4, 6 states that there is one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. Look, did you forget that this video is to convince people who aren't already Christians? Who are trying to figure out if they should believe that the God that created the universe is in fact your God? The whole point is which God did it? Which God should I believe in? right? Tossing out Bible quotes that say, look, the Bible says that it's my God, and so it can't be anything else, it can't be any other God, isn't going to convince those people. Like if someone asks you, hey, I, I accepted the cosmological argument, I think that makes sense and it's valid, and so I believe there's some kind of a God, but I'm not sure which one it is. You going, well, my God says that it's my God that's the God, so, like, what do you think that's going to do? <laughs> In light of these facts, it would be wise for all people on the planet to determine to know as much as possible about 
their creator. Yeah, well, it seems to me that that's what the people this video is directed towards are trying to do. They're trying to figure out what's really going on here, and they're trying to withhold belief until they have good evidence at each step of the way. I mean, if they've accepted the cosmological argument of all things, I don't know how that's really going to go. I don't know if they'll be very successful at finding the actual truth, but at least it seems like a good faith attempt. I don't know how your video is supposed to help, though. I don't really get what it was supposed to do in general, frankly. As the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah once wrote, But let him who glories glory in this, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Okay. What does that have to do with anything we've just talked about? Did you just close your eyes and open the Bible and point your finger at something at random? This was a weird one. I don't know what to make of that, but maybe you do. I guess leave a comment. Thanks for watching anyway, and please, if you would before you go, give the video a like and click subscribe if you haven't. And if you really like the channel, consider supporting. Even like a couple bucks per video or per month is enormously helpful. And huge thanks to all of my supporters who've already made that choice. For early access, join the email list, list.logic.com, and I'll see you next time.